Namaste. So Michael brought up an excellent question about sexuality and spiritual life. And I've been kind of avoiding this subject <laughs> because it's a fairly intricate subject, number one. And number two, there's a bunch of really immature people out there who like to troll me about it. <laughs> and the way that started was back in 1980s, there was a big problem with a Buddhist teacher, Chogyang Trungpa. And he went really over the line with this Tantra stuff. And as a result, I mean, he was a tulku. He was a reincarnation. So basically, he could get away with anything, and so he did. <laughs> but after he left his body, the Dalai Lama called 22 Buddhist leaders from the West to his place. And he said, you know, we got to stop this misbehavior of the teachers. So basically, they drew up a document. And it's very, you know, diplomatically, politically worded. But basically, what it means is that nobody can teach Tantra in the West, especially Westerners. <laughs> So, of course, this is an ultimate hypocrisy because the Dalai Lama himself is, is the acharya of a tantric lineage. And some of his close associates, like Dilgo Kiense, even they keep a consort for tantric practices. And yet, you know, he wants to say that Westerners can't teach this in the West. Well, of course, he didn't sign the letter. <laughs> he got the 22 uh, Buddhist leaders to sign it. Uh, but then he very, in a very tricky way, uh, didn't sign the letter that he basically wrote. <laughs> and of course, Westerners being Westerners and being passionate, took the whole thing to an extreme and they took it as a license to start like a vigilante group that harasses anybody uh, that, that they don't like, basically. And of course, I got on their list because my mother was a tantrika. My mother was one of the first Western tantrikas and she studied a discipline called karetsa. And you can look it up. That's it. Anyway, it's related to Tantra. So I taught this later on huh? because I learned it, I mean, really in my childhood from my own mother, you know. So later on, I taught Tantra in California and elsewhere. And at one point, some of my students approached me later on and requested me to teach them. And so I did. And, uh, and this blew up into a big scandal later on when I resigned from being guru. Some of the other disciples made a big issue out of it. And they've been stalking me online and harassing me with revenge porn and, uh, you know, blackmailing me and all kinds of other nasty, illegal activities. But wait a minute, who's complaining exactly? Are the people that I taught complaining? No. They're very happy with what they learned. But the others aren't happy. So what to do? The reason for this is nobody understands, or very few people understand, actually, the relationship between sexuality and spirituality. What is that relationship? Well, it's again, the, in the duality, huh? the two sides of the duality depend on each other, support each other. Huh? If you take one away, the other one falls down. So 
sexuality and spirituality, you know, the, the life energy, prana, is accepted in Vedanta as absolute. And that energy, just like white light, goes through a prism and gets, uh, how can I say, refracted into seven colors. The life energy, prana, when it goes through the body, gets refracted into seven chakras. Okay? And basically, life energy is sex energy. The body comes from sex, is generated by sex. So the sex chakra, is the, in Chinese chakra system, is the first chakra. Now, they, they had to adjust this because of some philosophical reasons in Indian philosophy and made it the second chakra. But for all practical purposes, it's the base. If the sex chakra is healthy, then the rest of the body will be healthy. If there's any problem with the sex energy, the rest of the body will be weak because it doesn't have the full energy available. Huh? Anybody who's read Osho's books knows all this already, okay? It's no big secret. So uh, enlightenment happens or let's say, let's just talk about samadhi for a while, okay? Samadhi means one-pointedness of the mind focused on itself. And a person in samadhi, practically they don't, they're not breathing. There's no external manifestation or, or motion at all. And even within, the mind is completely stopped. So what happens just before samadhi huh, is very interesting. The mind focuses on one thought. The whole mind is concentrated on this one thought. And then that's the last thought. <laughs> when that thought disappears, samadhi happens because the mind has to be empty. And that's the whole idea of Raja Yoga, which is the third stage, Vivartavada. Huh? I'm always going to go back to that chart, so you better know it. You better have it down cold. <laughs> that in the beginning of spiritual life, sex is discouraged, or, or at least very uh, regulated, and so in the Dvaita Vada, religious stage, and in the Vishishta Dvaita Vada, the stage of bhakti, uh, sex is, uh, if not prohibited or very tightly regulated, is gradually diverted to love of God. And that's what's needed at that stage. But in the third stage, in the Vivarta Vada stage, huh? This is, it becomes a practice, and this is Tantra. And the aim or the purpose of Tantra is to realize that sex is empty. It's empty, it's nothing. It's not going to give us the satisfaction that we're looking for. What we really want is samadhi. <laughs> Now, sex can be a practice that leads to samadhi. How? Well, it's described in the Bhairav Vigyan Tantra. Bhairav Vigyan Tantra, also known as the Book of Secrets, is a collection of 112 meditation techniques. And any of these techniques can lead to samadhi. Uh, four or five of them involve sex, and principally around the orgasm experience. Now, what happens in an experience of orgasm? I don't mean just a little bitty orgasm that you get from your boring missionary position sex. No, I mean a full-on, 100% orgasm, complete orgasm. 
tantric orgasm. What happens is that the mind in this, in this moment of uh, incredible pleasure, uh, all the energy of the body, the entire mind and attention becomes focused on this extremely intense sensation. And then it disappears. And this can lead to samadhi with the proper preparation. This is not a, uh, a broad excuse to indulge in unrestricted sexuality. No, this only works for people who are properly prepared. That means they have a very strong background and foundation in karma yoga, uh, the first stage of Dvaita Vada, and bhakti yoga, which is the second stage of Vishishta Dvaita. So without this foundation, these phenomena will not occur and a lot of people like to pose as tantrika, uh, but without the background, they're not qualified. I looked for a tantra partner in the West for years. I never found anyone who was qualified. I had to start my own ashram and train people up from scratch. So when we talk about the uh, orgasm, I mean, this is a natural thing. The French even have a name for it. Of course, the French have explored sexuality more than anybody. They call it la petite mort. It means the little death. After an intense orgasm, one can spontaneously enter samadhi. But of course, without the proper background, they won't benefit from it because they don't know what it is. They don't know how to value it properly, or how to connect it with the other things in their life. So they miss. It's a shame. But this leads to a paradox, and this is the title of the video, Sexual Paradox, that we see that the people who, once you develop sex habit, this doesn't apply to Naishtika Brahmachari like Ramana or uh, Chandra, uh, Chandra Shekhar Indra. They're Naishtiki. They're, they never had sex in their whole life. This, this doesn't apply to them. <laughs> but for people who, once they develop the sex habit, huh, it is seen that they do not attain enlightenment until and unless they develop their sex energy to the max. Yet, they also do not attain enlightenment unless they practice celibacy. This is a paradox, isn't it? Our logical linear minds, <laughs> our two-valued logic, has a great deal of difficulty with this kind of thing. But there are many such paradoxes in spiritual life, so we shouldn't let it discourage us. What it means is that, as I explained earlier, the sex chakra has to be fully open so that the energy can support the higher chakra functions. However, it cannot be getting leaked. The energy has to be kept within. So it can't leak out. Huh? So. That's why the practices of Tantra that involve sexuality, which is actually a, a tiny minority of Tantra practice. Uh, but anyway, those practices demand that we control ejaculation, we control orgasm uh, as much as possible. So, of course, everybody's all mixed up about this. <laughs> And especially in the West, there has been this false story that when we become enlightened, we, we see God huh, and we become like little angels, no sexuality, 
We're all pure. Huh? This is nonsense. Sex is a part of life. It's the origin of life. So without healthy sex life, you won't be able to attain. However, if you overindulge, especially in the ejaculation, you won't be able to attain either. So this is a problem. <laughs> this is a problem because our minds are inflexible and we, we have a hard time wrapping them around these awkward truths. Uh -huh. So this is why really the guidance of a guru is very important. Huh? Now I know somebody's going to say, well, Ramana was completely celibate and he instructed his disciples to be that way too. No. It was one instance where a disciple got married and someone approached Ramana with the news and said, well, I guess that means, you know, <laughs> they can't attain enlightenment, right? And Maharshi said, no. No. If the sex desire is unsatisfied, you cannot attain because the mind is going to be constantly distracted. And in that context, he said, better to do it than think about it all the time. Huh? This is Maharshi. <laughs> and of course, other great sages have... Uh, made arrangements for their disciples to get married and so on. It's a normal thing. It's a natural thing. Like, don't blow it up into something that, you know, that it's not. Huh? It's because of the Western tendency toward, uh, what were those called? The Puritans. Puritanical viewpoint that the body is bad, everything connected with the body is evil and sinful, an original sin and all that. Huh? So don't get caught up in that mindset. Look, you're here in the material world. How did you get here? Through sex. So you have to deal with the sex energy. You have to deal with the sex issue. Going into denial about it will not help. It will simply make you neurotic by throwing your sex desires and fantasies and so forth into the subconscious where they'll rot and fester in the darkness. <laughs> and become something, you know, even more uh, disturbing to your spiritual life. Then if you simply allow them, or even better, develop them in a tantric way so that they are not an obstacle to enlightenment. Now, I suppose there's going to be all kinds of comments on this. And naturally, it will attract the trolls. So let me just say right here, anybody making an off-color comment on this video will be banned from this channel. Okay. But I encourage uh, sincere inquiries and open-minded exploration of these issues because that's the only way you're going to get beyond the blockage uh, of the uh, incorrect practices and actually attain the enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Harihi Aum.